Good morning and welcome. And whether you spent last evening watching tennis, the last night of the proms, or both or neither of the above, I hope you're feeling inspired and cheered this morning. Um, please do be seated for the notices. First of all, I published the bands of marriage between Craig Anthony Burroughs and Emily Jane Spring, both of this parish. If any of you knows a reason in law why these persons may not marry each other, you are to declare it. And this is for the third and final time of asking. I'm happy to report that just over £100 was raised at yesterday's cake stall. So thank you to our bakers, um, those who came to look after the stall, and those who came to con uh, as customers to consume the cakes. Thank you for all of that. Um, there are some cakes left over. Uh, and so at coffee at the end of the service, they'll be available for donation, um, either with your coffee or to take home in a bag. So please do have a look um, as you make your way out at the end. There are also some books left from the sale on the pew to my right. So again, if you'd like to have a look and put something in the pot, if you'd like to take something, um, they're there for you to browse as well. Next Sunday, as we celebrate St. Edith of Wilton, we have three services. 8 o'clock Holy Communion, 10.45 morning prayer, and at 3 o'clock the Mayor's service, at which this year we'll particularly uh, celebrate the contribution of the various volunteers who have got us through uh, the worst of the pandemic. So the volunteers with Wilton Help and at the Vaccination Centre. Um, you're very welcome to come along to any or all of those services um, on Sunday. This morning service falls into two parts, morning prayer and then shorter Holy Communion. In the first part, you will need your red hymn book. In the second part, you'll need the white music, the St. Edith Mass, uh, but only in the second part. I hope that will all make sense as we get there. Let us stand then for the greeting. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you as we prepare to celebrate the mystery of god's love revealed in word and sacrament let us call to mind our sins let your faithful love come unto me o lord even your salvation according to your promise lord have mercy lord have mercy your word is a lantern to my feet and a light upon my path. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. I have gone astray like a sheep that is lost. O oh, seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. God, who in generous mercy sent the Holy Spirit upon your church in the burning fire of your love, grant that your people may be fervent in the fellowship of the gospel, that always abiding in you, they may be found steadfast in faith and active in service. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We sing our first hymn, number 766, 766.
And so we sit for our first reading. that we who teach will be judged with great strictness, for all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species, but no one can tame the tongue. A restless evil, full of deadly poison, with it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. For the same mouth came come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives, or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. This is the word of the Lord. Let us stand to greet the Gospel. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. Jesus asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life. Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of the Lord. 
Praise to you, O Christ. May my words and all our thoughts be now and always acceptable to God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. I don't know who selected today's readings, but I did find a little amusement in the fact that we have that reading from James set at the end of the first week of school term. Just now, I'm sure there are more than a few teachers around the country with vocal cords feeling the strain after the summer break who are wondering whether that advice warning against becoming a teacher was good advice after all. Both of today's readings seem to be concerned with the power of speech and whether to speak or not to speak. The injunction against becoming a teacher is perhaps a warning not to set ourselves up as more than we really are, presuming always to tell other people what to do or to direct their lives for them. And in Mark's Gospel, we have another instance of Jesus ordering those around him not to tell anyone what they've seen and heard. But then, almost immediately, he tells the crowds to nail their colours to the mast. They must not be ashamed to speak up for him and about him. To speak or not to speak, that is evidently the question. And behind the various images that James uses to illustrate the power of speech, there are some human traits we might well recognise. Those of you who are teachers and or parents will almost certainly have witnessed the phenomenon of one and the same child appearing to undergo a complete personality change depending on their audience. The child who at home is noisy, argumentative, funny, but at school is almost silent. The child who at home will only lift a finger to help after serious badgering, but at school or youth club just can't wait to volunteer for any task that needs doing. From the same mouth, we heard, can come blessing and cursing. From the same mouth can come grumbling or enthusiasm, can come a withering put-down and a warm encouragement, can come endless questioning or cool, indifferent silence all depending on context. And that's not always a bad thing. It's actually healthy, I think, that we learn to take account of both our situation and the people we're addressing. It's more of a problem when someone doesn't really understand what is appropriate, that the workplace is possibly not the right place for the kind of informal banter they'd use with friends. Part of that process is judging the right tone, is noticing the mood of the person to whom we're speaking. We know for ourselves that when we're tired or angry about something, we react to things differently than when we're feeling energetic and upbeat. And the slightest hint of criticism or correction at the wrong time, or a thoughtless comment, which makes it clear the other person isn't really thinking about us. That can cause hurt, which may run deep for years and may in fact never heal. Our words, once spoken, cannot be taken back. Happily, the opposite is also true. A well-chosen, well-timed word of encouragement or kindness can affect us just as deeply and can also last a lifetime. Our words then are powerful things for good and for ill. The day after the 20th anniversary of 9-11, the destruction of the Twin Towers in New York, 
Perhaps we can't ignore the power of speech to radicalize, to persuade others that extremism of one sort or another is a necessary path. Even without the reach of the internet, there are those with the power to manipulate through well-chosen words. And very often, the most susceptible to this kind of persuasion are those who feel, feel that their own words don't count for much, those who think that their voice is always ignored. They are more easily persuaded to find other ways to get attention. And I'm not just talking about Islamist extremists here. The same could be said for those from the white working class, as they're termed, who may find the attention and affirmation they crave within the more extreme and unsavory political movements of the day, whether that be the anti-Semitic left or the white supremacist right. The power of speech to give hope and encouragement can equally be harnessed to give false hope and to sow the seeds of hatred through misrepresentation of reality. So what on earth are we meant to do with all of that? Well, I want to suggest four main pointers. Speak honestly. Yes, the teacher may put on his or her teacher's voice in front of their pupils. And those same pupils may well act and speak very differently with their friends, their family, and their teachers. And that is all fine, provided they are still being themselves, not acting someone they're not. Judge your words carefully. If we know that someone is sensitive about a particular issue, and we have something about that issue we think we ought to say, we need to decide if we really do need to mention it just now to this person. And if we feel that we should, then at least prepare the ground gently and acknowledge the gulf that may exist between us. Speak up even when it makes you unpopular. If we only say the things that we think other people want to hear, what are we actually going to contribute to the society we live in? And where will be our self-respect? If we really do believe something, surely we must be prepared to argue for and defend it. Challenge untruth. From the distorters of religious belief, to the zealous anti-vaxxers whose claims seem to get more preposterous by the day, we need to be ready to counter false information. We say that the only thing necessary for evil to flourish is for good people to do nothing. The same could be said for speech. The only thing necessary for conspiracy theories to gain credibility is for the people that know better just to ignore them and hope they'll go away. Finally, there is another strand to all of this, <coughs> which is the effect that our own words have on us. When Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? He wasn't just after a quick ego boost. He was making them face up to themselves and what they thought they were up to. And as Peter blurts out, you are the Messiah, he convinces both Jesus and himself that he's ready to take on the harder truths that Jesus is about to reveal. The words that we say affect us, especially when we're speaking about ourselves and the things that matter to us. We recite the creed week after week, or perhaps day after day, because the repetition of those words form us. Over time, we are changed by those words. Even if that bold statement, I believe, may sometimes feel more like a statement of intent than of fact, a clinging to the life raft when we're struggling to believe, 
reciting those words together can encourage those around us and help us to keep faith. And in better times, as we say those words with ringing confidence, they become an endorsement of all that we feel and of the life we are experiencing. Again, there's a saying, you are what you eat. But Jesus said it's not what goes in, but what comes out of our mouths that define us. It might be more accurate then to say, you are what you speak. Let's come back then to the heart of today's gospel and the very direct challenge that Jesus gives to his disciples. Who do you say that I am? Not just what do people say, who do you say that I am? That surely is the most, the most fundamental question for any Christian, and for that matter, anyone who forms an opinion about Christianity. Who do we make, what do we make of this Jesus of Nazareth? Who do you say that he is? His question gives a very direct challenge to each one of us. And we must think very carefully before we answer. Words matter. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us stand then to affirm our faith as we say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried, he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I believe. Please sit for our prayers. Just as bread is the visible form of life-giving nourishment, so Jesus is the visible form of God's life-giving love. Let us pray to our God as we worship him in spirit and in truth. Heavenly Father, we pray for all who are commissioned and called to work as leaders and prophets in your church. We pray for greater discernment of your presence and your will in our Christian communities and clearing away of all that obscures our vision. We pray for your church throughout the world and in our own land, for our archbishops, bishops, priests, and deacons, our lay ministers, and all faithful people, that we may know when to speak and when to be silent, when to proclaim your gospel by words and when to proclaim your gospel by actions. And as we come to celebrate Holy Cross Day this coming Tuesday, we remember that there is both pain and triumph in that cross. The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray against the cynicism and complacency that deaden wonder. In the ordinary things of life, may we detect your love and wisdom 
to the everyday events. May we encounter you walking alongside us. And as we recall the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 terror attacks, we pray for all those who continue to be traumatized by those events, those who live with the memories, those who live with the pain. And we know that you walk alongside them in their suffering. And so we pray for the peoples of the United States, for President Biden, and for all those nations who lost loved ones in those attacks. And we continue to pray for the peoples of Afghanistan, for those who have set up power in that country and for those who are fearing the future. And we pray too for all those who have fled from their homes and who are now refugees praying that we as a nation may do what we can to accommodate as many as possible of those people who have left their homes forcibly. And as I was with the people of Glasgow this week, let us pray for all those who are preparing for the COP26 climate change conference at the beginning of November in that city and for all the discussions and agreements that we made during that time. All those who have the power to change the world and the way we live. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for breadwinners and sandwich makers and all food growers for your presence in kitchens, dining rooms, canteens, restaurants and bars, wherever people gather to eat together, may they find you there with them. We pray for our children, for those who are beginning school, and for their teachers, for those who will guide the minds and actions of our young people. We give thanks for all who took part in Ride and Stride yesterday, for those who walked and cycled, and for those who greeted. And may those connections help us to build up the family of your church. And we pray for all those who work in our town, especially those who work amongst those who are disadvantaged we pray for the work of Wilton Help, Elaborate, and the Trussell Trust. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we pray for those whose emotional damage makes trusting and receiving seem threatening and dangerous. We pray for peace of mind for the anxious and hope for all who are close to despair. Remember all those who are sick in mind, body or spirit, for those known to us and on our hearts at this time. And we give thanks for the health services that we enjoy, for our district hospital, for our GPs, our care homes, and our care workers who visit the sick and the aged in, at, in homes. And we pray for all those who are preparing for the flu vaccination program. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who have reached the boundary of death, that in faith they may journey through it and out into the unconfined spaces and the joy of heaven. We pray for those who have died in faith and gone before us, for those who have proclaimed the message of truth in their own age, 
for those who built this church and for the generations who have kept it in good working order. Remember those two who are special to us in our lives, those who have led and guided our thoughts and our actions. May they rest in your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And in the moment of silence, let us offer our own prayers to our loving Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we rejoice that the ordinary things of this world are saturated with your extraordinary love. And so let us join together in the prayer that Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our second hymn is number 748, and we'll omit the second verse. Hymn 748, omitting verse 2. Would you please stand?
And so we bring to a close this act of morning prayer, saying together the words of the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. God, our sustainer, receive the gifts we bring before you and feed us continually with that bread which satisfies all hunger, your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord is here. His Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Father, you made the world and love your creation. You gave your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Saviour. His dying and rising have set us free from sin and death. And so we gladly thank you with saints and angels praising you and singing.
We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit, that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again he praised you, gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross, bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation. We proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes, and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people, gather us in your loving arms, and bring us with Blessed Mary, St Nicholas and all the saints, to feast at your table in heaven. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, O loving Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though, Though we, we are, are many, many, we are, are one body, because, because we all share in one bread. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, Lord I, am I am not worthy, worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall, shall be healed.
Keep, O Lord, your church with your perpetual mercy. And because without you our human frailty cannot but fall, keep us ever by your help from all things hurtful, and lead us to all things profitable to our salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us stand as we pray for God's blessing. Christ, who has nourished us with himself the living bread, make you one in praise and love, and raise you up at the last day. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.